if you get reviewer feedback, all of that. Um, so that's what we are. So, to, so we give these um, seminars every month um, and we try to make it about um, topics that, um, that are broadly applicable to a lot of people. And um, this one is an important one. A lot of people have missing data. So Zhijin is going to talk about uh, a practical guide to how you can handle uh, missing data. All right, I'll hand it over to Zhijin. Thanks, Gordana. So I will share my screen. So can everyone see my screen now? We can see it. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so uh, good afternoon everyone, uh, I'm Jixin. So today I will talk about missing data. Missing data very common. Um, in quite a few, uh, quite many research areas like ecology, biology, uh, clinical research. So um, we uh, stay central, like visit this topic now and then and trying to guide researchers about how to um, provide and deal with the missing data. So a quick overview. Um, so the recognition and the treatment of missing data was advanced since about 1980s when uh, Professor Little and uh, Professor Rubin published their um, seminal book. Um, so though the title, seminal title is called General Guide, uh, Practical Guide about Missing Data, um, but uh, we well, have to say there is no universal recommendations to like say how to proceed um, with missing data based on proportion of, of missing. Uh, we will talk about that a bit more later. But however, we do have some universal principles uh, we can follow. So that's where uh, we, we're gonna talk about. And, and the key concept here I want to mention uh, forward is uh, one, we have missing data. So there are gonna be no definite analysis like we, what we do when we have the complete data set, but we can, we try to have um, sensible analysis um, as much as possible to have like um, uh, um, derived unbiased estimate. So what is missing data and when it happens? Um, the missing data com comes when you plan to collect the data but the data was not able to collect. So that's where the missing data occur. Uh, it could happen and more likely to happen in longitudinal uh, studies when we have uh, follow up visits and if the patient drop out or uh, then we can't have the data collected. And it, but it also could happen in the cross-sectional studies. Uh, here, I want to mention a special case. So that's come from a couple of consults and the research or student come to me say, um, I have uh, missing data. So th then they show me the summary, like sometimes quite a high proportion of missing. So I ask why uh, sometimes it's kind of like a laboratory, they have some laboratory data. Why is such, uh, such high missing? And they say, oh, that's because um, the reading is too low, it's below the, the range, the detection range. So I, we couldn't read it out. So that is something fell into the category called below limit of detection, or it could be beyond the limit of detection as well. And also in some cases, you like some, uh, you follow up uh, the study for a certain time point, then the event you, you tend to observe didn't occur by that time point. So uh, this type of data, even though you, you, you miss, you're sort of in the sense of missing because you couldn't observe them, but they are the, basically the truncated or censored data. So they are not the typical missing data because it's partially missing, it's not totally missing. You know, you know it's beyond or below a certain value. So there are different, a, a bunch of methods or strategies to deal with 
those kind of truncated data. Uh, so be careful. Uh, so these are not like the, the typical missing data we talk about here today. And the uh, methodology is also different. And so the final is why we need to be cautious about missing data, why we just can't just conveniently based on the over observed data to do the analysis and uh, draw our conclusion. Um, so that's the really is, uh, it potentially could bring us the substantial buyers for the estimate. Either we estimate association between two uh, variables or we are trying to evaluate uh, intervention. So the, then the effect uh, we estimate could be biased if we just based on observed data. And the, after we're gonna show you why. So first of all, uh, we need to prevent uh, missing data. Uh, I, I only have light touch today because that's not the focus, but uh, it's quite very essential. So in the design stage, when you just at stage to look at um, the outcome, the end point, you choose as your primary or secondary, key secondary out point, uh, end points. So think about if those potential, those outcome um, are kind of vulnerable to um, end up with a high proportion of missing. And if that's the case, think about if there are better alternatives, okay? And then uh, at, this is the stand design stage, then at the data collection stage. So we should try to minimize the dropouts, like to, to kind of prevent the attrition. So how to prevent the, the patients, particularly like in, in the longitudinal follow-up to drop out in the middle of the trial or your operational study. So that's uh, need quite sometimes a quite clever idea or clever um, strategy to keep, retain your, your um, uh, participant in your study. And then for when we uh, calculate sample size, and so we could uh, play in advance to accounting for the attrition we expect to have. Uh, the simple one is just factoring in the percentage of attrition, but uh, if you do have good pilot data and you know a bit about the attrition pattern, then we can actually factor in the attrition more uh, precisely uh, through simulation study whatsoever. So the below link give a good article. The article give good um, overview about this uh, sample size estimation. Okay, so next is we are now at say at that stage, we already got our data collected. So now we are uh, facing the potential missing data problem. So the first thing we do is to explore the nature and the extent of the missing data. So first is what variables uh, are missing in my study. Uh, so it could be our, it, that do I, do I have my response variable missing? Or is that just the explanatory variable missing? Or both, we have missing on both. And the next is what each of these variables uh, I'm interested but have missing, then what's the proportion of missing? And the proportion of missing, um, the concept is, so that's also a quite frequent question asked uh, during consultation, uh, say uh, I have certain proportion of missing, then what I do? But here uh, I want to put first is the proportion of missing itself, and it actually has limited information about the bias and efficiency. That is, um, it, it, we can't, solely rely on the proportion of missing to do any judgment about say, oh, I'm gonna have if high proportion, I'm gonna have very biased estimate, not necessarily. But there are some rule of thumb and the one in the literature uh, have been kind of agreement is the uh, one, the percentage is low as, uh, be, uh, as low as, um, as, low as uh, below 5%. Um, of the record. So uh, we expect generally um, then uh, if it's sort of more ignorable, which means if we conduct a complete record analysis, um, that, might, the, the, um, that might be acceptable and the le um, at less risk of have 
biased estimate, so relatively unbiased. Um, another question then, the final question is how much missing is too much? So how much missing why have this certain amount of missing then um, uh, probably um, I uh, do I have still have meaningful conclusion can be made from my data. So is that the 40% is a cutoff? And um, like I said, not necessarily. So that it, this is the point, the literature actually have different simulation studies uh, from different angle then have different uh, sort of recommendation. Uh, but uh, I think the, the bottom line is if your um, proportion of missing is over 40% uh, or around 40%, then you need to pay a lot of caution uh, to it and really have to think about the strategy to deal with your missing data. And uh, so that depends on like if your missing can be sort of predicted uh, by some other observed variables in your data set. Do we have a rich bunch of uh, auxiliary variables? And if not, so potentially um, you, it might be um, the time point to think about if I had need to shift my plan that had all this testing to have all this generating, or I need to shift from like a conformatory sort of analysis to become a more exploratory analysis. Okay, so another exploration point is we will, uh, it would be good to uh, look at what the predictors I collected and then they predict the missingness. So here then the missing, then missing is kind of a binary uh, outcome. And then we can use the logistic regression and to see what variables in my, in my study, in my collected data set can predict that missingness for that particular variable. And I already mentioned about the auxiliary variables. So what is the auxiliary variable? These are the variables. They correlated with the missing variable, but they are not necessarily of interest uh, in terms of a research question or of analysis, but they are very useful in terms of like help on the, um, to the, the missing data, particularly in the imputation setting. So another point to explore is the missing pattern. Like in the longitudinal study, um, like the, uh, the graph shows, so it could be more uh, monotonic, that which means patient, if they drop out, they drop out, for um, they never come back. So they're all the cell, one, one, one cell is blank, then all the cell following on blank. And they are also arbitrary um, missing, which means they can come, drop and come back, drop and come back. So there's irregular pattern here. And the last, and but the most important is the reason of missing. So what's the reason behind the way of the missing? Because that is closely linked to the missing ma uh, mechanism. So we're gonna talk about next. The missing mechanism is the foundation for us to make assumption and then to decide what strategy we use to deal with the missing data. Um, so that is was proposed by uh, Lito and Robin uh, around 1987, and then that's become the foundation widely used um, uh, in the missing data research area. So there are basically three um, mechanisms so the first is called the missing completely at random. So what that means, so they, when they propose it, it's probability based, but the way just uh, explain it in a plain language. So which means uh, uh, when you think about the reason of missing, so this mechanism means the process that generates missing had nothing to do with the nature of the research participants. So that is the, the missing is totally like just a random and maybe the patient move out of the state and you are using an electronic database and capturing the, the data within this state. So if they move out, then you don't have that part of data. But this process is nothing to do with your, your study. So this um, missing completely random in, the, in practice, not very uh, often. So that actually is the strongest assumption and it's easy to deal with. 
but just uh, not uh, um, too practical. The second is called the missing at random, MAR. So that is the missing, it's not totally random, but it depends on the variables we observed that are available from our study. So conditional on those observed variables, then that's missing, then at random. So this is the most practical and realistic assumption a lot of our uh, missing data strategy in, are based on. So the, the last one, the, the mechanism is called missing not at random. So that is the missing even conditional on the observed variables. The missingness is still more or less depend on the missing variable itself. So when it is missing not at random, um, there, um, we generally, what we can do is only can do quite a lot of sensitivity analysis and impose more additional assumptions um, to then evaluate the departure uh, from the missing at random. So uh, are these missing mech uh, mechanisms uh, testable? The answer is no, actually the hard part is they are not uh, testable. So then uh, what uh, the strategy we can use. So which means if they are not testable, um, we then need to uh, make assumptions. So our analysis, our strategy will based on assumptions. So in statistics analysis, assumptions is not, uh, uh, is quite as familiar um, uh, terminology. And uh, I believe, um, in our audience, if more or less you did analysis, you are familiar with concept about assumption. So the first, uh, so here this uh, is an overview table about uh, and the word mechanism and uh, what what the strategy we can use. Uh, so missing complete and random, like I said, so uh, complete case analysis is randomable, and we may lose power. But uh, we are not too much at risk of um, the bias of our estimate. And uh, in the meantime, multiple imputation, this um, strategy can also be used with the hope um, to might be improve the power. But anyhow, either of them, so we are not at risk of bias because that's missing completely the random or elusive observation, but the, the observed. Um, cases can be representative, well representative of the whole cases, the missing cases. And the next is called under the assumption of the mechanism of missing at random. So this one, uh, like I said, a lot of strategies are developed under this assumption because that is the most common realistic assumption here. So including the multiple imputation, maximum likelihood and inverse probability uh, weighting. Um, like I said, this is the most uh, realistic assumption. So we will put more attention on this in the following um, slides. And the last thing is missing not at random. And like I said, so we need more assumptions and a lot of sensitivity analysis. So uh, there are three major uh, approaches uh, for this missing not at random. One is called a selection mode approach or the part and mixture model approach or joint modeling approach. So they are quite active research area at the moment. Um, uh, so, but I, this, when, you, when we conduct, choose to conduct sensitivity analysis based on this assumption, uh, when we say we uh, make more assumptions, we do sensitivity analysis, uh, we need to pay attention. So we don't, you rarely choose one of the three paths to go but rather than use the three different models. So the sensitivity means different assumption, but not different methods. Um, so because for the time um, today, I will focus on the missing and random and the missing not at random is another large area, but um, we'll probably, uh, I give you an overview, but we don't go further for, uh, for this assumption. Okay, so not look at the missing and the random strategies. Like I said, there are um, um, basically two uh, main, main strategies. One is the imputation-based approach and the other is likelihood-based approach. 
And the inverse probably weighs, uh, weighting, the last one normally use the longitudinal studies. So the first imputation-based approach, and traditionally there's a lot of single imputation approach proposed, but then, then the multiple imputation come into place and becoming uh, more popular and uh, because it's uh, more uh, appropriate and uh, more, um, um, a uh, lot of advantages for more accurate estimation. So I won't touch too much down about the simple imputation, single imputation like mean or best or worst case. So we will focus on actually more on this multiple imputation in our talk today. And the other um, family of the pro, uh, strategy is called likelihood based. So that's making likelihood based on the EM algorithm Oh, there are full information maximum likelihood that's uh, more um, used in the linear regressions and also um, more commonly used in the stru structural equation modeling. And there are also Bayesian methods. Um, so uh, for the I, uh, IPW, the inverse probability uh, weighting, um, it basically two steps and it uh, used the logistic regression then to assign the weights to the complete case, then conduct analysis. So for researchers who are familiar with or use the uh, generalized uh, uh, estimating equation to deal with the longitudinal like correlation structure, if your data has, because GE only can handle the complete case, if you are going with the GE, but you have missing data, then this IPW um, method is kind of like um, joined um, nicely with the GE approach. So that's where you probably this, um, this is the approach you, um, you want to look at. Okay, so now we zoom in more about this multiple imputation. Um, Remember, so the, uh, in the, the general goal for the imputation or even in for other approach is to obtain the valid inference from our data. So the actual estimation of the missing value is not the goal, it's not of interest. The interest is why after we impute our missing value, we would be able to actually make unbiased estimate and the valid inference. So there are major two methods uh, under this uh, multiple imputation, one is called fully conditional specification, or, or, or sometimes we call it uh, uh, multiple imputation chain equation, MICE. So that is based on the univariate regression and intuitive and keep like an uh, intuitively um, um, impute. And the other one is called the joint multivariate normal imputation. So that is um, multiple, um, multivariate regression. Um, the advantage and disadvantage for this multiple imputation, um, comparing to the single imputation I mentioned, so uh, for multiple imputation, it, it can incorporate uncertainty into the prediction of the missing. So when we predict, we predict it actually is the distribution of the missing rather than a single value. So then uh, it's like take us a value randomly from the distribution we predicted. And another advantage is the benefit is that we can incorporate auxiliary, uh, auxiliary variables. So those variables not necessarily in the analysis, but can help for, for prediction, uh, help impute the missing data. So I think, the, I think that that is a very big advantage if you do have a lot of rich uh, auxiliary variables. And then it can improve both accuracy and cycle power, even like in the completely missing complete, completely in a random case. Uh, what's the coins? Um, what's sometimes being criticized for this um, approach is, so the results are dependent on your imputation model. So you different researcher who have, uh, you can use different imputation model and that will, um, you might have different uh, imputed missing and uh, leading to a bit different inference or estimate. And that kind of sometimes post the in not transparent, uh, the concern over this uh, multiple imputation. 
Um, but uh, uh, this uh, disadvantage, if we, uh, later I'll talk about reporting, if we give very detailed specification about what we did, the procedure, so this disadvantage could be, um, I think it's, it's not really a, 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 a quite a big concern. And in the meantime, and um, all the model, even max, max, maximum likelihood based model is also depend on the model it used as well. Uh, uh, finally, uh, so the multiplication, uh, like I say, is developed very uh, quickly. So it's kind of now become very accessible from the major softwares, including R, SAS, data, SPSS, this major software, we all can conduct multiple imputation. Um, so our word here is, um, even though it's very accessible now and a lot of good information online, so I would recommend if, if this is the first time you conduct multiple imputation, um, perhaps it's worth to book a consultation with our consultants um, to check the steps and uh, um, the way we would more than happy to guide you to uh, conduct this multiple imputation. And then uh, here is a, a overview about um, the, the uh, mice, the chain equation approach. Uh, so give you some sense about um, how to conduct it. Um, like I said, um, so even raising these mice, uh, there are also different techniques, like the standard using the linear regression, or we use predictive mean matching, or for multiple, uh, multi-level uh, data, we may use linear mixed model. So that's where I said, um, if you can, if you start to do it, and better to consult and ask for some advice from our consultants. But mainly there are three steps or three elements of say uh, involved in this multiple imputation. So the first step is to uh, construct your imputation model. So what is the imputation model? What are variable to include? So the variable includes in the imputation model, they should cover all the variables you, gonna, you are interested to include in your analysis. Okay, and then there are also more, like I said, the uh, uh, um, auxiliary variables. And, uh, and another note is if you have a planned inter interaction term in your analysis model, and that should be also included in your imputation model. And uh, how many imputation sets we need? So that a uh, number actually varies. A general range is from five to 10, 20, depends on the, um, how bad or how, like how bad or the, how high your proportion of missing or per, the information is missing. But in general, 20 is sufficient. Um, next, when we build up our imputation model and have our imputed data sets, and then we can conduct analysis as we usually do uh, for each, based on each of the imputed data sets. And which means we're gonna have multiple um, parameter estimates from each of the imputed data sets. So the third step is we use the Rubin's rule to pull those estimates and find have an overall estimate uh, for our study, like uh, we do as an ordinary kind of um, analysis. So that is the um, essential three steps. And, but in between the imputation model and analysis model, and after the analysis model, uh, we need to do, actually, we need to do the diagnosis and assess the imputation, and also doing model checking as zero. So we can utilize the, uh, the density plot, residual plot, and we compare the observed and the imputed uh, data in terms of their distribution and their mean or some summary statistics. Um, so the software uh, we use, uh, like I said, is, is now very accessible. Uh, for R, the, uh, the most um, um, popular package is the MICE or MI. 
Um, the MI particularly have some uh, building uh, model checking or imputation checking um, tools there. So the below link gives us a good uh, overview about the five common, uh, common packages. So the assess, I think recently they integrate into the uh, into a um, procedure called the program I. It's quite comprehensive, including um, doing uh, under the missing at random and also missing not at random uh, approaches. So and then data and the SPSS also um, have good function uh, for it. Okay, so let's do a bit summary about strategies. Um, again, uh, I want to remind, there is no definite analysis, but we are trying to conduct a sensible analysis uh, in the presence of missing data. So we may ask us uh, ourselves the questions to help us determine strategy. So like the first maybe if uh, is the complete record analysis likely to be valid? So that's the if, Yes, so that's a simple, that's the simplest case, right? Um, but that's come to ask if we are comfortable or confident about the mechanism is, is missing completely at random. So if not, then the, the complete record analysis is not appropriate. So next we can ask if the multiple imputation actually to offer benefit over a complete record analysis. So if it's missing at random, not complete random, then yes, multiple imputation or maximum likelihood method would uh, um, possible provide unbiased estimate and valid inference, but the complete record analysis not. But if complete, the missing completely at random and your missing proportion is high, and you have auxiliary variables, then the MI still can probably offer some benefit over your complete record analysis. And also we can ask if I need sensitivity analysis. So we talked about um, it's um, how, what's the proportion of missing is high and uh, what's the, if your missing information is quite high and then the maximum, we are not really confident it is missing at random. It might be missing not at random, which means it's related to something unobservable or it depends on the missing variable itself. So in that case, we need to do a, a range of sensitivity analysis to demonstrate the robustness of our estimates. So that is um, the um, strategies uh, we need to think about. And then after we uh, use the strategy we chose and uh, conduct analysis. So then it's come to the reporting uh, phase. As in the method section in, the, in our kind of paper or report, uh, we need to clearly state how our missing data was handled. So what assumption we make is MCAR, MAR, or MNAR. And then we justify uh, why we, uh, what the, the approach we chose to deal with the missing. And if the multiple imputation is needed, so we will in the method section specify what, um, what's the imputation model we use. So that increase the transparency and ease the concern from the reviewer about, oh, I don't know what your impute, imputation model you used. Uh, so that um, you, you might hide something from me. So that is increased the transparency. And then how many imputed data sets are used and all these sort of uh, steps you, you conducted. And if, we did the sensitivity analysis, then uh, what assumption, additional assumptions we impose to and what the method we use to conduct the sensitivity analysis. Then in the uh, result, se uh, result uh, session, uh, so we will um, report how the, we examine our missing data and uh, a table compared observed um, and the, the, uh, and the uh, missing uh, subjects, this missing um, value, um, compare their characteristic would be a good summary. 
Um, and then also when we're doing inference from those analysis, uh, we will in, in, interpret those analysis in light of the missing data. So here, um, this is an uh, example about um, in the study, how they report their uh, analysis uh, in percent of missing data. So you can see in the top, and that's the primary analysis. They uh, use the strategy multiple imputation. So they uh, then they have the over, uh, overall 14,000 um, cases. And then that's the, your, their regression outcome. And then they also present the complete record analysis. So you can see that's only 3,000. So they have actually quite a large proportion of missing, but that doesn't mean they couldn't do anything um, useful. So they present very clearly um, what we, they did. So they also uh, conduct a, a series of sensitivity analysis uh, with different assumption or uh, parameter, sensitivity parameter. So they use the um, part mixture model so then uh, they specify the parameter um, here. Okay, so um, the first the reference is the, the paper, um, the example table I present here. And then also there are other very good resources about talking about missing data. Okay, thank you. So I'm a bit over time. <laughs> um, yeah, so any questions? Thank you. Shijin, there's a question in the chat from Brennan. Oh no, there's a few, sorry. Oh yeah, no, that was it. It says, yeah. regarding mice with five imputed data sets, for example, is it appropriate technique to select the imputed data set with the smallest difference to the mean median or is pulling the imputed data sets more appropriate? Right, yeah. Um, so the first uh, uh, option you mentioned is just the chose one uh, imputed set and then do your analysis. That's in general, I don't think that's too appropriate. Um, um, basically we need the pooling the imputed data set. Like I said, the goal of the uh, multiple mutation is not to impute the value, missing value, but is to do the valid inference. But the valid inference actually come from um, a multiple um, data sets because that's um, your imputed value come from picked up from a distribution. He says, thank you. Any more questions? Feel free to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. Okay, well, it looks like um, that's all the questions for now. Uh, thank you very much, Eugene. Uh, very informative. I'm going to have to get onto that reference list and make sure I, I include it in my, um, when I do my imputation. Um, thank you everyone for coming and see you next month for another seminar. Um, see thank you later. everyone, bye.